Hello, this is Mr. Beck. Today I'm going to tell you about the four equations of motion. These are the kinematic equations for constant acceleration. Uh, what we're going to be doing in physics is mostly constant acceleration. If the acceleration changes, uh, we can't use these four equations. But we're going to derive four equations that we can use throughout the rest of this class. Now, the reason why we're going to use these four equations uh, will be demonstrated by this sample problem. Let's say that a car starts at rest and accelerates to a speed of 25 meters per second as it covers a distance of 100 meters. And we want to know what was the magnitude of the car's acceleration. It's always helpful when doing physics problems to write down what you know. So as we read this, we see a car starts at rest. Well, that tells me my initial velocity, which I write as V0, my velocity at time zero, is zero meters per second. It accelerates to a speed of 25 meters per second. Well, 25 meters per second is going to be my final velocity, 25 meters per second, as it covers a distance of 100 meters. Well, that distance is how far it traveled. I'm going to give that x equals 100 meters. It traveled 100 meters in the x direction. What was the magnitude of the car's acceleration? I'm going to write that the acceleration is, and I put in a question mark. So these are the four variables that I'm interested in. Now, so far, the only equations we have to use are my acceleration equation, which tells me that acceleration, or average acceleration, is my change in velocity over time, which is my final minus initial divided by time. And the other equation I have is that my average velocity is my displacement over my time, x or delta x over t. Now, if I have initial velocity, final velocity, position, and I'm looking for acceleration, I can't use this equation because this equation has time in it. And I can't use this equation because this equation has time in it. So I'm stuck. So I've got to do a couple of uh, interesting things. I know that my average velocity, when I'm doing constant acceleration, just like if you have an average of two tests, you can take the tests, add them together, and divide by two. So for constant acceleration, I know that my average velocity is half my initial plus my final, or my final plus my initial. Um, I also can plug those in because now I know my final and initial velocities. So my average velocity turns out to be 12 and a half meters per second. Now I can use my x over t because now I have my average velocity and my time, so I can solve, sorry, and my position, so I can solve for my time. So I get 12 and a half meters per second is 100 meters divided by time. So as I plug in my values I have, and then I wind up with the time is 100 over 12.5. So that gives me eight seconds. I still don't know my car's acceleration. So now I have to go back to my original equation. Acceleration is V minus V zero over T. So my change in velocity is final velocity of 25, initial velocity of zero divided by eight seconds, giving me an acceleration of 3.125 meters per second squared. Well, that was a lot of work to get one answer. So that's why we want to do equations of motion for constant acceleration. They're going to make this much easier. So what we do is we start with our two equations, our average velocity equation and our average acceleration equation. Average velocity is my change in position over time or my displacement over my change in time. Acceleration is going to be my change in velocity over my change in time. But just to eliminate some of these variables on the get-go, I'm going to say that, you know, since this is my final and my initial, if I just set my initial velocity, at, sorry, my initial position at zero and my initial time at zero, you can see that a bunch of these will cross out. So now the time that I'm dealing with will just be my elapsed time. My position, my distance is going to be the distance traveled during the equation, during the uh, what I'm looking for. So this V average turns out to simply be x over t. And then my acceleration, I still have V and V0 and t. So, um, but my average acceleration, interestingly, is going to be my acceleration overall, because if the, it's a constant acceleration, then the average is going to equal the value that I have. So that means that my acceleration is my final min minus my initial velocity divided by time. So now I have two equations that are in a form that I can manipulate. If I take this acceleration equation, what I can do is I can multiply by t and then solve for my final velocity by adding v0 to both sides. So v0 plus at is v, and I like rearranging that one more time. So I say my final velocity is my initial velocity plus acceleration times time. That is the first of my four equations of motion. My next equation of motion, what I'm going to do is take my average velocity equation, which said v average is x over t. Um, and an average, again, is going to be my initial plus my final divided by 2. This works for constant acceleration. So I can take that and set it equal to x over t. This divided by 2, I'm going to move and make that a 1 half. 
So now I have one half of v0 plus v is x over t. Now I'm going to multiply by t, and I'm going to rearrange to the other side. So if you want to pause and take a look at that, you'll see. So x is one half of v0 plus v times t. This is my average acceleration here in the middle times my time. So x is my average acceleration, sorry, my average velocity times my time. Now I'm going to combine equations. I'm going to take these two equations and I'm going to substitute this v, 0 plus at, where this velocity goes because they're equal to, you know, this is equal to v. So I'm going to take this equation and where this I had v, I'm going to put my v0 plus at. So that should be fair since v equals v0 plus at. Now I've got v0 plus v0, which gives me uh, 2 v0. And now I can take the t and distribute it in. So I'm going to wind up with 2 v0 t plus at squared. And now I'm going to take this 1 half and distribute it in. And of course, 1 half times 2 gives me 1. So I've got v0 t and then 1 half at squared. This is my third equation of motion. So my distance traveled is my initial velocity times time plus half the acceleration times time squared. Now, my fourth equation comes from taking this first equation and solving for t. So if I want t all alone, I've got to subtract v0, divide by a, so I wind up t is v minus v0 over a. I'm going to take that t and plug it in here in this second equation where I have a t. So I'm going to take this and then multiply it by the t, which comes from over here. Now a bunch of rearranging happens. I want to move the half and the a and get them over to the other side. So I multiply by a. I take this one half, move it over to the other side where it becomes a 2. So 2ax, let me hold on to that on the side, is v0 plus v times v minus v0. Now what I can do from this, you might remember FOIL, first, outer, inner, last. Well, I multiply the firsts, I get v0v. The outers give me negative v0 squared. The inners give me v squared and the lasts give me negative v0v. If you're paying attention, you'll see a v0v over here and a negative v0v over here, so those cancel out, leaving me with 2ax is negative v0 squared plus v squared. I'm going to add v0 to both sides and rearrange one more time. So I get v squared is v0 squared plus 2ax, and that is my fourth equation of motion. So these four equations are going to be the key to what I'm going to do from here on in. So if I take these four equations, I can see something interesting about them. If I take them and I look at the variables within the equations, I'll notice there are five different variables within these four equations. I have position, acceleration, final velocity, initial velocity, and time. Those are the uh, variables that I'll find in these equations. But this equation, v equals v0 plus at, has a velocity has an initial velocity, has an acceleration, and has a time, but doesn't have a position or a, or a displacement in it. My second equation has a position, an initial velocity, a final velocity, and a time, but it doesn't have acceleration in it. My third equation, if I take a look, has a position, uh, an acceleration, an initial velocity, and time, but it doesn't have a final velocity. And this fourth equation has initial and final velocities, has acceleration and distance, but it doesn't have time. Now what's interesting is most of the problems we're going to do are going to have three out of four variables and missing a fifth and not caring about a fifth. So many motion problems can be solved using only a single equation. So let's see how that works. Let's go back to this sample problem. You remember this? Um, it was about nine minutes ago where we looked at this problem and we had to do all of this calculation, multiplication, re-manipulation uh, in order to get to our acceleration. But if we take another look at this equation, and we again have our four variables, our initial velocity of zero, our final velocity of 25, our distance of 100 meters traveled, and we're looking for the acceleration, what we can do is we can look at our four equations of motion. Now here you see that um, I have initial and final velocity, I have distance, and I have acceleration. I don't have time. So what I do is I look over here at my four equations, and I look for the one that also doesn't have time. What that means is that I don't know about time and I don't care about time. So this equation also doesn't know and doesn't care about time. So I like to say, I don't know and I don't care. So if your parents ask what you're learning in physics, you look at them and you say, I don't know and I don't care. That's how you pick the right equation. So this equation, v squared is v0 squared plus 2ax is the equation that I'm going to use. Now I have final velocity of 25. I have initial velocity of 0. 
and I have a position, a distance, of 100 meters. So 25 squared is 0 squared plus 2a times 100, or 625 is 200a, divide, and I've got 3.125 meters per second. Bingo, I've solved it in a single equation in, what is that, four lines. So much better than that previous try that we had. Now there's one more thing that's interesting about these equations of motion is that they connect to the motion graphs that we're learning about. So if I have a velocity time graph, there are a couple things I remember about the velocity time graph, but looking at this first equation, all I have to think about is the, the equation for this line. You remember that the equation for a line is y equals mx plus b. The y value is the slope times the x value plus the y-intercept. Well in this case y on our graph is v for velocity x on our graph is t for time, the slope of a velocity time graph is the acceleration. It's my change in velocity over time. It's my rise over run. So my change in velocity over time is my slope, is my acceleration, and my y-intercept here is v0. So if I just plug in my y equals mx plus b, I wind up with v equals v0 plus at. How convenient is that? The second equation is x is one-half v0 plus v times t. Now if I look at this and I want to know my position or my distance traveled during this equation, during this problem, um, it turns out that the distance traveled on a velocity time graph is found from the area under the velocity time graph between the line and the axis. So this shape turns out to be a trapezoid and if you remember your geometry you would know that the area of a trapezoid, which will give us our position, is a plus b over 2 times h. So this is going to be my a, which is going to be the height v0. My b is going to be my v, and I'm going to divide by 2 and multiply by my h. In this case, h is going to be this side is going to be t. So it's kind of my base times my average height. So that's a plus b over 2 times h, or v0 plus v divided by 2 times t, which is my 1 half v0 plus v times t. So that's pretty neat. But there's another way that we can get the area. And the area could also be split in. Here's my third equation of motion. If I look at this as a rectangle and a triangle, that's probably what you would want to do in the first place anyway. I can find the area of this triangle, which will give me a displacement, and the area of this rectangle, which will give me the rest of this displacement. So the triangle happens to be one half the base times the height. So that's one half of t times my height. And the height here is going to be my final velocity minus my initial velocity. So that's v minus v0. But wait, that doesn't look like anything good. But I can do something neat here. I can multiply both top and bottom by time. So if I do that, I'm going to have t squared and divide by t. And what's v minus v0 over t? Well, that happens to be my acceleration. So the area of this top triangle is 1 half at squared. Then the area of the rectangle is my length times my width, which is going to be my time and my initial velocity. So the area here is going to be v0t. And if you look, the total area is v0t plus 1 half at squared. So that is a neat way to tie these three equations to the motion graphs. And uh, I invite you to take a look at some of the sample problems and um, enjoy using your four equations of motion, which we will use for the rest of the year. Thank you.